This video constitutes part four of the online lecture series on back pain, specifically providing an insight into the systematic approach to interpretation of common diagnostic imaging tests which are associated with back pain. So if we look at the imaging recommendations or indications for four common presentations beside, we can see that CT assumes a major role in cases of high velocity trauma or altered levels of consciousness. X-rays constitute the initial evaluation and then CT is a follow-up for recommendations for fracture evaluation as well as suspected pre-vertebral pathology. In patients who have histories of low velocity trauma, osteoporosis, chronic steroid use or point tenderness, presenting with chronic or acute back pain, the initial evaluation always includes an AP and lateral radiograph series. Radiographs are also the first choice to confirm suspicion of vertebral compression fractures. And then lastly, MRI is considered the best modality for spinal infection, cancers, herniated discs, as well as spinal stenosis, including the assessment of neural structures. I should reiterate that clinical suspicion should always be considered before deciding upon which imaging you're going to do. So for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to teach you how to approach or interpret common scans of the cervical and lumbar regions based on common clinical suspicions as well as mechanisms of injury. Due to time constraints, I won't be covering DEXA in this lecture. However, you should read up on the gold standard scores and recommendations, which are consistent with osteoporosis and osteopenia. So then starting with the approaches to the cervical spine injuries, most suspected C spine fractures are going to be followed by thin section CT with reformation for the most accurate evaluation. Patients with histories or examination which are highly suggestive of C-spine injuries, so such in the case of high-speed car accidents, proceed directly to CT under a trauma protocol, followed by an out-of-collar lateral clear cervical spine scan. All individuals with signs or symptoms of spinal cord injury require an MRI, and it is also prudent to obtain CT in patients with unexplained prevertebral soft tissue swelling. If we then move on to the systematic approach to interpreting C-spine scans, there are three standard views that are required or requested as part of the C-spine series. This is a lateral view, an anteroposterior or AP view, as well as an odontoid peg or open mouth view. In the context of trauma, all of these may be really difficult to attain or acquire because the patient may be in pain, they may be confused, unconscious, or unable to cooperate due to immobilization devices. The ABCs of the cervical spine provide a helpful mnemonic to guide the systematic assessment of these x-rays. So note that this constitutes an amalgamation of a variety of sources and textbooks in order to help to simplify it for you. So the first A is adequacy. So we need to make sure that the C7 and T1 junction must be visible in the scan. Secondly, alignment. So ensuring that three reference lines are contiguous or uninterrupted. So this constitutes the anterior longitudinal line, the posterior longitudinal line, and the spinolaminal line. Next, we need to assess the bones. So each vertebrae must be examined for fracture, collapse, avulsion by tracing the cortical outlines of each bone and making sure that the facet joints are parallel to one another. Next, if we look at the cartilage or the intervertebral discs, we need to examine these for symmetry or normality of the discs in between each vertebrae. And we also need to make sure that they are relatively an equal height. Next, we need to assess the dens for chips or fractures. This is also called the odontoid process. And then lastly, soft tissue. So some fractures can cause widening of the pre-vertebral tissue due to hematoma. However, lack of thickness should not be reassuring and accordingly, CT follow-up should be required. So pre-vertebral swelling is defined as approximately two thirds of the adjacent vertebral width. Alternatively, if we had to quantify this, the prevertebral space should be 
equal to or less than seven millimetres anterior to C2 and less than two centimetres anterior to C7. Lastly, the edges of the scan should also be examined to check all other visible structures. So this image from Slack and Clancy provides a visual representation of the approach we have just discussed. So if we start with the pre-vertebral space, any tissue thickness greater than seven millimeters anterior to C2 is considered abnormal. Naturally, the cervical spine is considered to be lordotic in curvature, so that means it's going to be convex anteriorly. And the reference lines that are discussed or denoted help to determine if there is an exaggerated lordotic curve. C7 and T1 junction must always be visualized to ensure film adequacy. And if we look at the reference lines, which help to assess the alignment of the scan, Number one represents the anterior longitudinal ligament line. So this is going to be a perfect line drawn between the anterior curves or outline of the vertebral bodies. Number two represents the posterior longitudinal line, which is a line connecting the posterior curves of adjacent vertebrae. And then four is going to represent the spinolaminar lines which is the junction between the spinous process and the lamina of adjacent vertebrae. If we then look at a normal lateral C-spine x-ray, if we apply the approach that we've just discussed, we can see that this is considered to be an adequate scan as all vertebrae are visible from the skull base to the top of T2. It is correctly aligned. So if we check for the anterior line, which is the line of the anterior longitudinal ligament, the posterior line, so line of the posterior longitudinal ligament, as well as the spinal lamina lines, which is formed by the anterior edge of the spinous processes, we can see that these are all going to be continuous with one another if we superimpose the lines onto the scans. So we can see that these are going to be nice, smooth lines. There are no bulges or interruptions throughout. Next, if we look at the integrity of the bone, if we trace the cortical outline of all the bones, especially on the anterior and posterior aspects, we can see that there are no fractures. So next, if we assess the vertebral discs, we can see that if we're starting from the junction of C1, C2 all the way down, the intervertebral discs are roughly the same or equivalent height. We can also see that there is no apparent bulging of these discs as would be denoted by abnormalities in the reference line curvature as we spoke about before. Next, if we look at the soft tissue, so normal prevertebral soft tissue is going to be relatively narrow down to C4 and then it's going to widen. So above C4 we can see that this is going to be less than a third of the adjacent vertebral width. If we then zoom into this lateral view and we look at more of the intricate anatomy or bony details, if we can see if we're looking at the bone, the cortical outlines are considered to be well-defined. Um, so make sure that you force your eyes around all of the edges of the bone to help you to identify or eliminate possible fractures. We can also see at C2, we see this circular hyperdense structure which is considered to be a bone ring of the axis. So this corresponds to the superimposition of the lateral masses which are viewed side on and these form a ring of corticulated bone which is denoted by the red ring. This ring is not complete in all individuals and may appear as a double ring. A fracture may sometimes be seen as a step or an interruption in this ring outline. And then the next type of view is what's called an odontoid peg or an open mouth view. So this view is considered to be adequate if it shows the alignment of the lateral processes of C1 and C2, which are denoted by the red circles. So the distance between the peg and the lateral masses of C1, so denoted by the asterisks, should be equal on each side in a normal individual. Note that in this image, the odontoid peg is fully visible, which is not often achievable in the context of trauma due to the difficulty in patient positioning. So now that we've seen what is normal, let's consider the potential injuries using the mnemonic Jefferson bit off a hangman's thumb.
So a Jefferson fracture is defined as a burst fracture of C1, the atlas. A typical mechanism of injury is diving headfirst into shallow water. Axial loading along the axis of the cervical spine results in the occipital condyles being driven into the lateral masses of C1. This will present as unilateral or bilateral fractures of both the anterior and posterior arches of C1. So on the anteroposterior open mouth x-ray, we can see displacement of the C1 lateral masses from the odontoid peg or dens. A distance greater than six millimeters suggests ligamentous injury. So in the normal reference scan provided, the zygoptophysial joint between the superior and articular facets of the two vertebrae should align. So if you imagine drawing two lateral lines, between these joints, there should be no lateral displacement or deviation of the atlas inferior facet. CT is then required for firstly defining the full extent of the fracture, secondly detecting fragments in the spinal cord, and on the CT provided, we can see a four-part fracture with double fractures through the anterior and posterior arches in this patient. If we then move on to a hangman's fracture, this is also known as a traumatic spondylolisthesis of the axis. This is a fracture which involves the pars interarticularis of C2 on both sides and is usually a result of a hyperextension and distraction injury. The clinical presentation will include post-traumatic neck pain after a high-velocity hyperextension injury, which is the most common cause. Neurological impairment is seen in approximately 25% of patients. So this fracture is best demonstrated on a lateral C-spine view, and the radiographic findings will include bilateral C2 pars, or pedicle, which is going to be less common, fractures. Secondly, we may see anterior dislocation or subluxation of the C2 vertebral body, or we may see an avulsion of the anterior inferior corner of C2 due to rupturing of the anterior longitudinal ligament. Prevertebral soft tissue swelling may also be evident. So in this patient, if we trace the posterior longitudinal ligament line, we can see that there is an area of radiolucency associated with C2, which is going to correspond to the pars interarticularis. So this makes us suspect that there is a fracture associated with C2, and then follow-up CT is required. And then the last type of fracture that I'd like to look at is what's called an extension teardrop fracture, which typically occurs due to forced extension of the neck with resulting avulsion of the anteroinferior corner of the vertebral body. So these fractures are considered to be stable in flexion but unstable in extension as the anterior longitudinal ligament is disrupted. So radiographic features in the aforementioned scan include an anteroinferior corner fracture of the vertebral body, which is an avulsion fracture from the attachment of this anterior longitudinal ligament to the corner of the vertebral body. The fragment is considered to be an irregular shape, which is reminiscent of a teardrop. The vertical height of the fragment is going to be equal to or greater than the width of the vertebral body. Additional fractures are also very commonly associated with this type of fracture, and thus CT is indicated in all cases. Before we move on then to the lumbar region, on the lateral C-spine provided, I want you to think about if this scan meets the adequacy criteria discussed. So if we trace the reference lines and count our vertebrae, we can see that C7T1 is not visualized in the scan. So based on the assessment so far, everything looks normal. And in this patient, additional attempts to image the cervicothoracic junction were unsuccessful, and so they requested a CT scan. CT reveals that a teardrop fracture of C7 is indeed visible, and we can also see displacement of the C spine. And this is why it's really important to make sure that that first A, which represents adequacy, is met because of the likelihood of missing fractures in the C7 and T1 region.